Good morning. Welcome to Sunday School this morning. The, tel- the title of our study today is Weathering the Blues. That's what we, we have been studying the last six weeks when emotions rise, that and if they are kept in proper uh, perspective, well, then we obey God and deny self, and that means we do not let our emotions run wild with us. We know that if we look to God and trust in him, then he will help us no matter what. And weather in the blues uh, today, you know, and how many of you know what January the 18th is? Nancy knows. What is it, Nancy? The, the gloomiest day of, of the year. You know, this really was named, I guess, following Christmas. Have a letdown following Christmas or either if you've made New Year's resolutions and maybe you haven't uh, stuck with those resolutions. And therefore, uh, it, it is named the gloomiest day of the year. Well, you know, many are gloomy, but uh, we know that Christmas is, has passed and we look forward to a new year. And we can find answers for the gloomiest day of the year. And that is, we can turn to Psalms 31 that gives us the instruction for obeying God. And we know that we can often feel overwhelmed uh, because we may have circumstances that cause a strain. It may be a financial strain. It could be a health issue. It could be a family crisis uh, that may be causing us to have a gloomy Uh, outlook and you know it can even be a spiritual outlook Uh, we we can let our circumstances get us down if we do not take hold and let God lead us and guide us put our trust in him and as I mentioned we will be uh, studying this morning in Psalms 31 we'll study about David and the fact that he had difficulties, which we really do not know what they were, but he put his faith and his trust in God to help him to overcome whatever difficulties he had. And uh, we know that he chose to trust God, and Psalms 31 gives us words of encouragement that we also uh, can let God take care of our own circumstances. And the point is, God lifts us up when we feel down. Praise God for that. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we go into this study today further, help us to discover the way that we should do when we have circumstances that try to overwhelm us, and we certainly don't want to fall into a blue situation without trusting in you to help us and lead us to overcome these. In your name we do pray. Amen. Well, we know that uh, indeed David, as I mentioned, he looked uh, to God. He trusted God. So we can often, often, as I mentioned, feel overwhelmed and we know that uh, we also can trust God. And in the scripture, in the first two verses, it said, Lord, I seek refuge in you. Let me never be disgraced. Save me by your righteousness. Listen closely to me. Rescue me quickly. Be a rock of refuge for me. 
a mountain fortress to save me. So we know that David began with this psalm. It was an appeal to the Lord for him to seek refuge through God, through, through the Lord, and he did not want to be disgraced. And we ourselves, we find and have times of depression, but if we let it overcome us, where it would become a physical uh, situation rather than a, maybe a spiritual situation. And what I mean is, instead of letting God take hold and trust in him, we know that we do in, you know, a clinical or, or medical situation is altogether different. And David experienced moments of depression. And whatever the nature of his problems were, well, he sought refuge in the Lord. As he said, I seek refuge in you and never let me be uh, disgraced. But he did not mean, he, you know, he was referring, he called on Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord. And, you know, we know that he really uh, did not want to be disgraced. In other words, he didn't want people looking at him and pointing toward him and saying that he had done something wrong. But David believed in humbly submitting himself to God as he knew that God would bring glory uh, to him rather than shame, rather than disgrace. And he, you know, he said in that first verse, he was pleading with God to save him. And he knew that he had a close walk with God and that he would deliver him. But how did he actually expect the Lord to save him? Well, he knew that it wasn't on his own merits uh, that, you know, he would bring all of this on him, but it was the Lord's righteousness. We know in studying the Bible in the Old Testament, was David a perfect person? No, David was not a perfect person. Had David committed sin? Yes, several times David had committed sin. He had committed wrongdoing. However, he realized it took a lot for him to realize that he had committed some horrible, horrible sin and turned his life over to Yahweh, to God. And how did he expect the Lord to save him on the basis of what he had actually done? As I mentioned, he turned to the Lord's righteousness and all. And David begged the Lord to listen to him. And he pleaded with him. He said, listen closely, Lord. I need your help, and I don't want it to bring a disgrace. I want you to rescue me from the circumstances that I'm going through that are trying to pull me down. And he was asking the Lord to do it quickly. Woo, you know, we, when sometimes we have pain, we have surgery, no matter what it is, if it's medical issues, something like that, we want instant healing, don't we? We don't want to put up with the therapy and all. And how many times have I gone through it? I know. And I've said many times, I said, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing great, but I surely wish I could hurry up and get better. I wish I didn't have to go through this therapy and all. However, I do know that it's very important. And God doesn't give us instant healing, does he? We have to wait on the Lord. But David told him to the Lord, I want you to rescue me, and I want you to do it quickly. And he, he, indeed, he said, never be disgraced. He didn't want to be ashamed um, or feel that, you know, he was a stumbling block in someone's way. And we know that when he mentioned that he wanted to give him a, he asked the Lord to give him a rock of refuge. Oftentimes in the Bible, they would mention a huge rock or place that would provide shelter from the weather, shelter from also maybe a fighting force 
However, we know that Yahweh are to be his rock of refuge and his mountain fortress, that he used that uh, because he felt like that, that would give him a strong hold on his situation and help him to get back into the type person or situation that he was in, even though we did not know or do not know what his circumstances were. But he told the Lord, said, be my rock, be my salvation. And we know that David was pleading with the Lord uh, in Psalms 31, 1 through 2. And it was just reflecting of situation of circumstances he was overwhelmed with. Sometimes we get in situations like that, and we are encouraged to turn everything over to the Lord and to trust in him. We know, we, as I mentioned, we don't want it to weigh us down, not let it weigh us down without seeking God, refuge, and all. In the third and fourth verses, said, for you are my rock and my fortress. Now, that's already been mentioned in the first two verses. Say, you lead and guide me for the name's sake, for your name's sake. You will free me from the net that is secretly set for me, for you are my refuge. David recognized the Lord's sufficiency uh, to help him deal with the concerns that he had. And we too can find also help and comfort uh, as we take our concerns to God no matter when it is or what it is. And we knew that David knew that the Lord was his source of security when he was mentioning, you are my rock and you are my fortress. And Indeed, although uh, we know that we had used in the second verse, uh, as I mentioned, all he was talking about being his rock and his fortress, he was pleading and calling on the Lord again uh, because he knew that the Lord was the one who would lead him into righteousness. For the name's sake, he said, you are my rock and my fortress, you lead and you guide me for your name's sake. And he knew that by putting his faith and trust in the Lord, that he would lead and guide him wherever he wanted uh, David to go, whatever he wanted David to do. Even though David was helpless without the Lord, without the Lord's guidance and all. So, And it also mentioned in verse 4, you will free me from the net. Well, that's just like if a person goes hunting and all, and they try to trap maybe their bird hunting, as they do close to my house. Uh, you know, and they, of course, they don't actually use a net, but some people use a net to try to capture a bird and all. I hear the go, gun go pow, pow, because the dogs have pinpointed where the birds are and when they'll fly up and all. But David's concern was the fact that he didn't want to be considered that he was in the net. I want you to free me from this net. It feels like a net over me, and I cannot escape this overwhelming feeling that is creating this disturbance in my life. And so he was pleading with the Lord for his protection in the midst of all of these circumstances and all. And he, he mentioned the primary meaning of that was... Well, saying that it was secretly said. Well, that's true. If a hunter goes, even if it's deer hunting, they are up in a stand trying to pinpoint where the deer will be coming through the woods and all. And therefore, they take aim whenever they see one. But the thing about it is that the primary meaning of that is that it was a hiding or hidden object that would help them overcome and to get their prey. And David was feeling like he was in a net and that it was keeping him from doing what the Lord wanted him to do. He wanted to depend on God for his faith and trust in him. However, you know, it was 
a time and a situation in his life that he had to truly, and it wasn't something secret either. He said that he felt like that this net that he was under was a secretly set for him. And it was also considered the fact that God was his refuge too. And he mentioned several times in the first four verses about seeking refuge, seeking God as a fortress for him. And it, you know, even though the emphasis as far as that net falls on the secret, well, we know, in fact, that what he was telling that he could trust in God because he was a righteous, holy uh, God. And that God knew everything about him and he would lead him into the right direction that he wanted him to go. So when we feel overpowered by financial situations, health issues, or crisis in our family, no matter what it is, if we put our faith and trust in God, truly, truly pleading with him, we don't ask him to do it uh, automatically right now. Sometimes we say, God, I know that I want instant healing or I want instant relief from family crisis or financial woes, whatever it may be. But he will answer our prayers in his own time, on his timetable. And he says in uh, his scripture, come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Hallelujah. I tell you, that is wonderful, wonderful, knowing that we have God as our Lord and Savior, and we can put our faith and trust in him. We just got to have patience and let Lord, the Lord lead us and guide us uh, to. In the next scripture is verses 5 through 8. Into your hand I entrust my spirit. You have redeemed me, Lord, God of truth. I hate those who are devoted to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your faithful love because you have seen my affliction. You know the troubles of my soul and have not handed me over to the enemy. You have set my feet in a spacious place. Well, in the midst of his internal or external turmoil that he was going through, David decided to deposit his life into the Lord's hands. He mentioned, into your hand, I entrust my spirit. And we too uh, can uh, trust the Lord to carry us through. And we know that we need to do that more and more. And, of course, we know this sounds like a familiar passage that we know that we have read and we've studied uh, and heard. Well, who but our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as he hung on the cross, did he say to his heavenly Father, that he was turning his life over into his hands. And, you know, that's very, very uh, familiar to us. And we know that uh, that hand that he's making reference to, it is the power uh, that God gives. It is the strength that God gives. And it's also the authority that God gives. Our Lord gives us power. He gives us strength. He is the one that has authority over our life. He knows everything about us. He knows our needs even before we uh, go to him in prayer. And we know that he was saying, in trust to David, commit your spirit wholly to me. And that's exactly what David was doing. We know that he said that, uh, indeed, I commit my hands to you, Lord. 
I submit myself to your power and to your authority. And we know that the spirit encompasses a range of meanings. Um, it could be mind, it could be wind, it could be breath that we uh, breathe and all. But we know that indeed, God is in control. And also in studying this, the spirit represents the whole person of life. Given force, the Lord gives each individual according to his needs. And then even in the time of great need, David had not lost heart with God. He did not become impatient with him at this at particular time because he possessed a very real personal relationship with the Lord. And the covenant title for God that conveys his nearness and his concern was for his people. And even through the years, we know that there have been many martyrs who have suffered for God, who have suffered because of their relationship with the Lord. They are also people, missionaries, and others that are today suffering because of their relationship with God. People that do not trust in God wholly. So we know that he mentioned in these verses that we know that God lifts us up when we get down, do we not? And that's exactly what we, we need to cling to. Redeemed is sometimes seen as an assertion what the Lord had done for David, and sometimes it was a continuing plan for deliverance and all. But we know that it mentioned that he was a God of truth, and the Lord revealed himself um, on one who abounds in truth, who abounds in certainty, and who trusts him in confidence that he will see them through the situation or the circumstances, whatever it may be. And then he mentioned that into your hands, I entrust my spirit. And Jesus freely submitted, did he not himself to the Father's will? When he, we know that he expects us to do the same thing. And as believers in Christ, that we should do no less about submitting to his will than what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did uh, for us. And as I mentioned, there were several ancient martyrs who sacrificed for knowing and producing and for committing their life to Christ and for sharing um, God with people that did not know. We know about Martin Luther, and also there uh, were many, Polycarp, who was an early Christian martyr, and other people who have submitted wholly to God and not let other people get them down. In the days that are coming, we know not what we are facing. However, we need to keep trusting in God for him to lead and to guide us through stormy weather. And in verse 5, it concludes with David's declaration that the Lord was a God of truth. And we know that the Lord revealed himself as one who abounds in truth. And, of course, we know that truth is a characteristic of God's nature. And he depends on us to be truthful with him. And David announced his trust in the Lord uh, regarding the worship of idols, which he said in this scripture and uh, that he hated idols. He hated idol uh, worship. And, you know, that was just an emotional attitude that he had toward people who were worshiping idols. Do we have idols in our lives? that are preventing us from having a close relationship with him, we have to do a recount and a recount of our situation. Do we spend more time in something that is not for the best of our interest rather than to spend more time in prayer or more time in reading God's word, more time in witnessing for God? These things we can 
we can probably go back and say, well, if that is taking too much of my time, then that's idle worship. And we know the Lord said that he hates those who trust in worthless worship. And he opposes and detests that which a person desires. No, not having a relationship, a close relationship with him. And while the Lord rejected his people to reject the ways that were wicked and all, we know that the Lord also loves all people and encourages his people to reject worthless idols. And, you know, he said it could just be like a vapor. It could be like a breath or as far as false gods there in, um, in Israel as they were uh, worshiping idols and all. And he never, never liked the false gods or the idols that they were worshiping. And David trusted the Lord indeed. So we know that he said in his word, when we put our faith and trust in him, that we can be found faithful for four reasons. You have seen my affliction, David said. You know the troubles of my soul. You have not handed me over to the enemy. You have set my feet in a spacious place. And indeed, David vowed to rejoice and to be glad because of the Lord's love and just the fact that he knew the Lord was going to get him through the situation that he was in. And he had determination to be joyful and to love God. And he knew in the scriptures, he said, you have a faithful love. And he conveyed the concept of both love and fidelity because God never let him down. He will not let us down because we know that he is a God of love. And David testified that the Lord had seen his affliction and that he knew his troubles. And he was very pacific in that regard. And he said, you have not handed me over to the enemy. And he said that you have not abandoned me, Lord. And he was trusting God. And he knew that God would see him through. Patience is one thing that he was hoping for and lacking in. So, you, you know, he said, though, you have set my feet on a spacious place. Face and place, and that means that you've caused me to stand, you've caused me to get established and have a better and a stronger relationship with you, Lord. God had granted him a broad area of footing when you put him in that spacious place to realize that he was going to assist him, he was going to help him, he had not abandoned him because he had these problems, because he had this trouble and all. He said, even if your enemy tries to overtake you, I am protecting you, and I have caused you to stand firmly for me. And the Lord not only prevented David's enemies uh, from being victorious, but he also set his feet in that spacious Place. He kept referring to that spacious place. And we know that he was establishing him to become stronger, become more dependent on him, and to believe that he would get him through the situation. So it was just like he was saying, you know what I have done in the past when I brought the Israelites through the promised land to the land of Canaan. Put your faith and trust in me, David. Listen to me right now. You can trust me all the time. Not just one time, but you can put your faith and trust in me all the time and all. And we know that the Lord's deliverance of David through this circumstance that he was going through, whatever it may have been, that it was bringing a new freedom uh, to him and it surrounded him with peace. It surrounded him with security. 
when we have a need and we have a circumstance, whether it's financial, whether or not it's family crisis, whether or not it's a spiritual situation, if we just put our faith and trust in him and if we acknowledge that need or to the Lord and acknowledge the fact that we've got to put all dependence on God, then we too can be like David and experience the Lord's lifting us up when we feel down and how wonderful it is that we have the Lord on our side. He's on our side all the time, is he not? Thank you, dear God, for your study of this word, what David was going through, Heavenly Father. We know not what it was. However, regardless of what the situation may have been, you brought him through. He struggled, yes, and there are times in our life, and you know this situation in our life now, Heavenly Father, and we know that we must trust in you completely and wholly. And others sitting here, Heavenly Father, they perhaps also have some kind of issue. And we pray, God, that they too will trust in you. We know that you know everything about us. You know what is going through our heart. You know what's going through our mind. You know what we are facing tomorrow. But we know who holds tomorrow, and we know who holds our hand. And help us, Heavenly Father, to trust in those situations, to trust in you, God, because we know you'll bring us through. And may we be a shining light for you, that you will be glorified, and not us, Heavenly Father. We love you. Ask your forgiveness. If we have done or said anything that's not pleasing in your sight, Heavenly Father, and may we leave your worship center today with joy in our hearts, saying it, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord with other Christians worshiping you. And if there's anyone here that does not know you, we pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them to come to you and accept you as Lord of their life is our prayer in your name. Amen.